Hello, good morning. Okay. Today our guest is Professor Edward Dutton. Hello, Ed, how are you doing? Hello, yes, I'm doing all right. Yes, yes, how's it going with you? I'm great, Ed. Ed, we're going to have a jolly time because we will be discussing your paper on witches. It's oh, a yes. fascinating paper, and just look at my face. I enjoyed reading every bit of it. Let me look for the title so I can share it with the audience. The paper is titled Witch it, do talk, it's, it's Early Modern Witches and Demonic Sexual Fantasies and Evolutionary Perspective. So, Ed, this is my first question. What were the traits that set witches apart from other women and by witches were referring to women who were accused of witchcraft they were not actually witches or were no, they well, different of course, well some of, some of them some of them genuinely believed they were witches uh, i get into and, that uh, and and confessed to witchcraft and were hanged accordingly but um the, the main traits that set them apart is that well, first of all uh, in most countries particularly in england they were a overwhelmingly female they were overwhelming, they were mainly older women over the age of 50. They were far older women, far more likely to be accused of witchcraft, and they were disproportionately spinsters. So um, um and in terms of in terms of anecdotes, so unmarried, unmarried old women. And in terms of anecdotal evidence, it seems that they were you were more they were regarded commonly as ugly, as physically unattractive, which would be one of the reasons why uh, you would of course, end up being a spinster because you were physically unattractive and men didn't want to marry you. Um, uh, uh, and in, in addition, they tended to be uh, anti-social women that people didn't like, women that were aggressive, women that would curse their neighbours in, in a society that genuinely believed in the power of the curse and in the nocebo effect. Uh, and, and they were overwhelmingly of low socioeconomic status, so they tended to be poor at the bottom of the pile. So those were the main characteristics of early modern witches. And Ed, you started the discussion by saying they admitted to being witches, but why would one admit to being a witch? In some cases, in some cases, um, there was, well, what was understood to be a witch, you, you can conceive of two, at least two competing um, systems of religious power. So on the one hand, you've got uh, the, the sort of pure Christianity of, or Protestantism, which has syncretized with earlier pagan practices, and then you still have these remnant pagan practices. And people in the countryside in the 17th century still had some belief in the power of these, of these pagan practices, in basically in magic, they still, they still believed this. And so they, they, they believed it was real. And so they would go to so-called cunning folk, as they were known, or wise women, in order to be cured of things and, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. And there was one particular case where there was this, uh, this young girl uh, in uh, Yorkshire, Lancashire, and she cursed this person. She believed she was a witch. She was from a family of witches. She, cu she cursed this person. Uh, and he had a stroke or something, believing presumably in the power of the curse. And she felt so guilty about it that she went and confessed that she was a witch and that she had done this. And she right. genuinely believed she had magic powers. All right. And in your paper, you also argue that controlling these women were they were they form of patriarchal authority. Explain. Well, um, if we understand uh, uh, in terms of uh, evolution, there, there are different levels of selection, different ways that you can successfully pass on your genes. One is by having children. One is by looking after your kin uh, and, and you know, your nephews and nieces, that kind of thing. And another is, is group selection by um, indirectly passing on your genes by promoting the interests of the group. Now, under a, a system of group selection, you have groups that are sort of battling with each other for control of resources and that sort of thing. And the evidence indicates that the groups, all else being equal, that are the most successful are those which are high in positive and negative ethnocentrism, so that are internally cooperative and are uh, lethal to outsiders. Now, one of the things that interferes with this is men fighting. Uh, men fighting with each other. This is going to reduce intra-group uh, cooperation, and you want to elevate intra-group cooperation because those are the groups that survive. So if you introduce patriarchal systems whereby men can be sure that their children are really theirs, whereby men can be sure they're not cuckolded, that sort of thing, then you're going to have less intra-group conflict, and therefore you're going to have more male cooperation, and you're going to have a more group-selected group. So that's, it's been suggested, one of the reasons why patriarchy um, developed and why patriarchal groups tend to dominate and why patriarchy tends to become you know, the will of God. 
because what patriarchy does is it promotes basically uh, positive ethnocentrism. And it's a group that's high positive ethnocentrism tends to triumph. Now, the problem with a lot of these witches, uh, these women that are accused of witches, is witchcraft, is there is a degree to which they are either explicitly challenging the religion that promotes the patriarchal system by having their own separate religious system, the cunning folk, you know, where they offer cures and things like that, or they are indirectly challenging it by showing that it is by, by, by not conforming to it, by, by not getting married, by not having children, by showing that it's possible to operate as an independent woman, to operate financially as an independent woman. So this operates as a, as a challenge to the, to the system. Uh, in addition, um, the evidence is that those people are, are quite masculinized psychologically and physically. They're quite ugly. They're quite unattractive. They're quite unpleasant people. And so at a time of, of want and of famine, then um, those are the people naturally that an adaptive group is going to turn on because they are individualists that are a challenge to the religion of the group. And so, that, um, and so that's why I think they were turned on in, the, in certain periods of history. Um, particularly when after we became particularly religious. You remember that in early medieval Europe, witchcraft was tolerated. Um, it was condemned by the Bible, but it was tolerated. Homosexuality was tolerated. It was condemned by the Bible, but it was tolerated. Jews were tolerated. Muslims were tolerated. And as, as we become, as it basically gets colder, and as group selection becomes more intense, um, then people become more religious. And these peoples are decreasingly tolerated. And you start to get witchcraft becoming illegal, Jews being persecuted, uh, Gnostic sects being persecuted, the rise in heresy laws, that sort of thing. And basically, it's just selecting out those who are different, uh, who in some way undermine the group-oriented system, including the patriarchal system. And that's what witches are doing. I agree with you, Ed, and just let me read a snippet from your article for context. Females who were disinclined to conform to patriarchal norms would be increasingly removed from the gene pool, though they might still manifest each generation through mutation, unlikely gene combinations and or environmental factors. Yes, that's right. So every generation, I mean, these people were physically ugly. Uh, that's stereotypically. So that betokens basically you've, you've got a society of people that what what what, what were we under selection for in these harsh conditions? We were under selection for intelligence. We were under selection for pro-social personality traits. We were under selection to be group oriented. We were under selection to be religious to be, and be, to be conformist to the patriarchal religion. And so. The witches were not that. The witches were not group oriented. They were selfish, individualistic people um, who would gain fights with people and were generally unpopular. Uh, the witches were not conformist to the patriarchal religion because often they would practice their own form of religiosity and they would curse people and things. I mean, this is testified to. Um, so so they, they were individualistic. And every generation indiv uh, who undermined the group oriented system and specifically the patriarchal system. And so therefore they were a problem for the society. And a society under harsh group selection would find religiously sanctioned ways of removing those people. Um, and that's what they did. Um, uh, similarly, uh, people that were at the bottom of society who were beggars in some contexts were often accused of witchcraft. People that were beggars, why? Well, because those people were at the bottom of society. They tended to be violent, antisocial people. They were basically dead wood that were parasites off the society. And so the more efficient society will find ways of getting rid of them. So it's basically a eugenic act, to, uh, or, or at least to, to, not that they were going to have children, but to, to, it, is, it, is, it is removing something which spreads negative social epistasis in society, which spreads individualism, which spreads indirectly undermining the patriarchy, uh, which spreads ill temper and whatever, uh, and just general unpleasantness. And you have to find a way in, religiously in a religious society of justifying getting rid of them. And that's what witchcraft seeks to do, and not just there, but in, in more primitive societies as well. Remember, Ed, that on average, men are more individualistic than women, but even contemporary women, like feminists, prefer aggressive men. They like masculine men, but men do not like masculine women. Therefore, it, it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint to be against witchcraft because women who are accused of engaging in witchcraft tend to be masculine. So they wouldn't meet good sexual partners. That's right, they wouldn't meet sexual, but they wouldn't uh, meet successfully sexual partners, and therefore they would tend to be, uh, often they would be, if they were, because they were poor, that's another thing, they would often be burdens off the community, so there'd be a poor law, and people would have to pay 
to fund these, these spinsters who don't have no children and nobody to look after them in old age. So they were burdens off the community. Um, because they were aggressive and masculinized, the, their behavior patterns testified numerous that they were aggressive people that were cursed people, um, uh, were extremely unpopular, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and um, and uh, again, even the, you, know, you, you get sometimes men that were accused of witchcraft, and these would tend to be antisocial, unpleasant men that nobody liked as, 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 as well. So often, so, so sometimes these people were just accused of witchcraft. They weren't, they weren't guilty. I think it was just to get rid of an, an antisocial element. Um, but over, overall, and that's a, uh, an adaptive thing to do for a group, but overall they tended to be women. And why, why they focused on women is because uh, women have to be controlled in a successful society. And they were out of control. They were implicitly undermining the system and explicitly undermining the system. Um, uh, and, and so they were a particular problem from, from the religious perspective. And so they, they dealt with them. What you said about the feminism is very interesting. Um, I argue in the paper that um, people, these witches, they talk about these, the, 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 the devil having sex with them. So the devil, they say things like the devil appeared to me and, and he sucked my nipples and we had sex, for painful sex for six nights. Or the devil appeared to me in the form of a black man in my room and, and, and had sex with me or whatever. The devil appeared to me and had anal sex with me or, uh, in the position of a dog, all this sort of thing. And what's always been suggested is, oh, well, these, these, these were crazy confessions. They were induced under torture, this hysteria. But that's not true. Uh, torture wasn't used in English law. It wasn't used. Um, for, certainly not for witchcraft. So these were not induced under torture. That's just a fact. They weren't. These were confessions that were voluntarily confessed to. And so what I suggest in the paper is that what you're dealing with is rape fantasies. Um, and from an evolutionary perspective, uh, women who are um, individualistic, who are sociosexual, who are fast life history strategists, are more likely to have who, uh, the kind of women, therefore, that would be unsubmissive to the patriarchy and would end up as uh, spinsters in a society like that um, and would be masculinized looking because they'd be a past life history strategy. Those kinds of women would be prone to have rape fantasies because um, they are evolved to a fast ecology where you live the past, die young. The man's not going to invest in you. So the only kind of man you want is, is a muscular, strong, tough, violent bloke. And the way that he will show that he is that is by overpowering. And so therefore, in a weird way, um, you would fantasize about, in a sense, being ravished by him or being uh, raped by him. These fantasies involve being raped or being ravished by a high status, strong male. And um, that's what I think is going on with these rape fantasies. And interestingly, feminist identification, as I show in the paper, we correlates with having rape fantasies because what are feminists? They're individualistic, fast history strategy, uh, masculinized sort of women. They're the kind of people who would have been accused of witchcraft in the past. Yes, and in your paper, you also note that women who were charged with witchcraft tended to be promiscuous. Some worked as prosecutors prostitutes and prostitutes score lower in the personality traits of agreeableness and conscientiousness than other female controls. Indeed. So that's, again, consistent with it. That what we're talking about is sociosexual women, fast life history strategy women, antisocial women. And what the patriarchal society does is it tends to control those and suppress those um, and, and control female sexuality. It's worth noting as well um, that as it got colder um, from the high middle ages onwards, prostitution becomes less socially acceptable. And, and as you go north to England and places like this, it is more socially unacceptable than it is in Italy and, and, and whatever. Um, there were cases I noted in the book of prostitutes in Italy who would openly go to church because it was, it was like good advertising in the community to go to church and look your best and, and, uh, and so on. And there were a number of cases of prostitutes that were accused of witchcraft because these prostitutes could be regarded as undermining the patriarchal system. And also women that had illegitimate children as well um, because, they, because they are behaving in a sociosexual way. They're not submissive to the patriarchy and this is dangerous. And so from a group's perspective, so it would be adaptive that those people are, are accused of witchcraft and are removed. Although I should say that another thing is that when, when people say that Oh, uh, witchcraft, oh, it's just hysteria. Um, the the Eng English uh, law was very, very sceptical of witchcraft. Uh, and with the exception of when there was hysteria that broke out, for example, in 
the witchcraft prayers of the 1640s in Suffolk around the witch finder General Matthew Hopkins. Apart from that, uh, you would, the tendency was that women that were accused of witchcraft would be found not guilty. The legal system was skeptical of it, um, so that there was a very high level of proof that was demanded before that, that they were found guilty, often confessing as well, without torture, because they genuinely believed they had magic powers and felt guilty about it. I mean, imagine what it would be like uh, if, uh, in that context, for a woman, a single woman, um, she's never had sex, uh, and she has this sexual fantasy that she feels ter terribly guilty about, about somebody, you know, some stranger, some dark stranger raping her or whatever. You can see how she would interpret that as the devil appearing to her. You can completely see how she would think like that. That's what would happen. And Ed, another important caveat is that women are responsible for socializing children they're also more empathetic than men and these women were low in empathy so again there was aggressive selection ag against women expressing such traits because more than likely they would not have they would not have been good mothers no they wouldn't have been good mothers um, but, uh, but um, to be fair in, in I mean, in the general, in general, it was menopausal women that were accused of witchcraft. So it's it's not necessarily selecting them out of the gene pool in that way. That's why I would see it more at the level of, of group and of, of, of social epistasis um, than of the, the, the directly genetic level. It's the good of the group. It's it, it's for the good of the group that antisocial elements, who even though they haven't committed a clear crime, are removed. And how you do that? You can cut you you can develop this concept of witchcraft which permits you to um, remove them from the society so that they can't negatively impact the society so that they can't undermine the control of other women uh, who are more patriarchal uh, uh, and so on so I think that's that's what's going on as it's not just as I say it's not just uh, women of course that are targeted it's people right at the bottom of society beggars who might be considered parasitic of society and therefore a problem. Um, it's uh, people that are just generally regarded as antisocial, uh, who are male, which is very unpopular. So it's just, it's a way of making this, the level of group orientation of the group higher by removing highly individualistic antisocial people. I, I, I really find, find this paper to be quite fascinating because it has implications for even contemporary discourse. So, for example, Anne Hathaway recently starred in a movie titled Witches, and some were objected to the portrayal of witches as ugly. But based on what cartoons have displayed over the years and what you're saying, this stereotype is actually accurate. Women accused of engaging in witchcraft were not attractive. No, they, of course, no, they wouldn't be because we, we, we have good data on the fact that there, that there, there is a, a correlation, a, a relationship between being basically consistent. I've got, there's a number of recent papers that have been published on this. So people that are conservative, um, they are group oriented. They are high in the moral foundations of obedience to authority, loyalty to the group and sanctity. People that are liberal, they are individualistically oriented. They are high in the value of equality, i.e. you want the same as everybody else, you're jealous of people have more than you, um, and of harm avoidance, i.e. You, you don't want to make sacrifices for the group. And they may well then identify uh, uh, in order to obtain power. They're also Machiavellian, being individualistic, they tend to be Machiavellian. So they will identify with other people who they regard as like them. You know, they see themselves as constantly under attack and under threat. They're evolved to a, a fast life history ecology in which everyone's against them. They just have to look out for themselves. Um, that's been shown. But first of all, that those people, the, 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 the conservatives, they are higher in altruism higher in conscientiousness, higher in pro-social personality. Those people who identify as liberal, they are lower uh, in those traits. But also it's been shown that people that are conservative are just objectively better looking. Their faces are more symmetrical uh, and they're regarded as better looking. Well, why would that be the case? It's because we, are, we have selected over a long period of time for, cer for certain things and therefore they have become player typically related. So if you have, as it were, good genes, you have low mutational load, then you will be intelligent, you will be um, a pro-social personality, you will be religious, you will be conservative by modern standards, um, and you will be good looking you will, because you have low mutational load. What the Industrial Revolution has brought about is deviation from that, and therefore any deviation from it should be associated with high mutational load and thus physical ugliness. 
And that would be why individualistic people, left-wing people, are objectively less attractive overall than right-wing people. And what you have with the witches is you have people in that, because even in that context, you get mutation, and it's not like absolute purging, you know, um, who, who, who deviate from the group-oriented pressures, and therefore those people are physically unattractive as well as mentally unattractive. It makes complete sense that that would be the case. And indeed, it was documented that it was the case. And um, this physiognomy thing, has been observed right back to the Bible, right back to the ancient Greeks. It is, it is very real. Ed, so recently I went to a police station. I was examining the station for various reasons. And I looked at the profile of criminals, their physical profiles, and they all looked alike. Well, yes, I mean, yes. Was, I think it was Francis Galton that first demonstrated that, that, that there was, a, that he, he overlaid the faces of you know, the criminal and the non-criminal or whatever, you know, and he showed that there was a, there was a definite look to the criminal. And I think there's, there's also more recent Chinese research that has done that. And it was taught to us as a sociology student, but the leading theorist at the time was, well, not, a, he's deceased now, an Italian academic who made a link between the physical structure of individuals and their ability to participate in crime. I can't remember his name. Yeah, Lorenzo or something. Yeah, yeah yes, Lorenzo. yes, the Italian academic. But these days, people don't take this perspective seriously. But when I was in the prison, I thoroughly observed the faces of those men, and they looked alike. Yes, well, well, I, mean, I think they looked alike. But there, there was the Chinese research indicated that there was more diversity in in their faces than in those normal people, which would be consistent with higher mutational load. Um, but also that there were certain traits which they had in common, such as eyes being closed, in indications of things having gone wrong early in development. You know, eye, basically they were physically ugly and higher in masculinization and things like that. Um, and certainly now with computer learning, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, AI can identify a person who's more or less likely to be criminal based on their face, with a, you know, a, a, more than would be the case by chance. So it really does work. And so you would expect that, yeah, you wouldn't expect that to be the case. There would be a certain look on average that would be associated with criminality because they would be probably higher in mutational load and also in testosterone and things like that. And where nasal bridge is also different from the average person. That was a striking um, difference. Was, yeah, I think they did. I think that's right. I think there was in the Chinese research evidence of smaller noses um, among, among uh, um, like less sort of Roman-like noses, as it were. Uh, among criminal people. And again, this is associated with testosterone and it's also associated with sort of things going wrong early in development. So people that have like Down syndrome or whatever, they have small noses, uh, wide faces that's associated with criminality. Again, yes, their faces tended to be a bit broad. Yeah, that's right, because it's a reflection of high testosterone uh, and, and various other minor physical abnormalities that would, that would be higher among them. So I mean, your observation, I'm sure you're a very observant fellow Lipton, as we know, and, um, and, and your observation, I'm sure, was, uh, was correct. And it's consistent with a growing body uh, of evidence. But there is a puzzle, Ed. According to research, men with broad faces tend to be adept at negotiating. Criminals do have broader faces, but their faces do not appear to be pro-social. So a criminal with a broad face, when you look at him, he seems happy. Sorry, I mean, uh, uh, someone, uh, a successful person with a broad face, when you look at him, he appears to be happy. I was saying that research also shows that men with broader faces tend to be better negotiators. And I've looked at that study. And when I compared positive people I know with broader faces, their faces were more pro-social. Um, well, I don't know. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't very aggressive. They, they, they looked like they were always smiling. Oh, well, I don't, I don't, I, I, yeah. I think that there is, there is some evidence that having a broad face is associated with lower intelligence as well. So maybe that's um, maybe that's part of what was going on. But I think with with negotiation, there, there is to, to be a successful negotiator. Um, okay, on the one hand, you've got to be diplomatic and whatever, but you can be diplomatic because you're just naturally kind, or you can be diplomatic because you're sort of narcissistic and you train yourself to be to be good at something like that. And it's it's like the cut and thrust of business negotiation, you know. And successful people in business are very high in psychopathic traits. Um, and presumably therefore high in testosterone and have wide faces and so on, but they're also going to be excellent at negotiating uh, because a huge part of business is being able to negotiate with people and being able to win them round and having a sort of, the sort of superficial charm and whatever that is associated with psychopathic personality. 
So I don't necessarily think it's a contradiction that people that have wide faces are going to be good at negotiating. Yes. Yeah, business people do score quite highly on psychopathic traits. They pretend to be tactful, but in, in, in reality, many of them are not. But let's get back to the issue in relation to mutational load. Michael Woodley of Meany and co-authors wrote a book called Modernity and Cultural Decline, and they parlay many studies showing a link between atheism and negative social traits. So for example, criminality or admitting that one has participated in criminal activities. And I'm just edu educating our audience, or better reminding them that there is a clear link between religion and pro-sociality. In, in fact, non-religious people are more likely to commit certain types of crime, and they are also likely to express anti-social sentiments. Yes, that's right. Yes, they, 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 they in that book, um, Matthew Seraf and uh, Michael Woodley and Colin Film, uh, they, they, did, they, they do marshal a great deal of evidence for, for the existence of um, that relationship and also for the fact that, that um, we, are, we do have increasing mutational load uh, on uh, health, on mental health, on physical health, on personality, and deviating from pro social personality and on in, intelligence. Uh, yeah, they do. But Ed, this part of the conversation will become a bit controversial. You highlighted a fact that we both know. Women like to be sexually dominated. Why is this so? Feminists would, would argue that it's otherwise, but this is not what the studies have been showing us. They're more uh, like... No, um, the, the women, uh, if, women will sexually select for uh, status because they, um, uh, in in prehistory anyway, um, it was only males with high status who would pass on their genes. So it was better to be part of a high status man's harem than to have one husband uh, who was of low status because the high status man can uh, invest more in you. And um, also personality wise, why has he got to high status? Well, because he's intelligent and pro-social and so he won't sort of nub you and leave you. And so women will sexually select for status. And the patriarchy and that system has meant that women who are not patriarchal will be selected out. So therefore, it basically selects for women that want to be led and that want to be um, dominated. Um, it's because the other kinds of women weren't attractive because they would be considered a cuckoldry risk uh, and so on. And so the imposition of patriarchy can be seen to have elevated this kind of difference between the male and the female, whereby the female sexually selects for um, a status. I, and, and in that sense, um, to be dominated, to have the male of, of higher status than her. I think we should distinguish between that and women that um, have uh, have rape fantasies or who want to be hit into masochism and things like that. I think that's that's a sort of a, an extreme edge of it, an extreme R strategy, whereby you get a contradiction, which is that such a woman will actually be quite socially dominant. So the evidence is that women that are case strategists that aren't sociosexual, they're not into masochism and things like that. Um, it's the women that are sociosexual that, that are actually quite socially dominant that are into that. And that's because those women are evolved to an ecology of, in, of total instability in which you just have to survive. Therefore, they're quite dominant. But therefore, the man that you will want in that ecology will be a man who is basically violent and aggressive. And, th and therefore, they will be attracted to evidence of that violence uh, and, and aggression. Uh, and so I think that's kind of um, helps to make sense of that contradiction and also the rape fantasy that um, man you want in that ecology, violent and aggressive and prone to rape. So I think that's what's, going, that's, that's what's going on there. Let me read this revealing passage from your article. Though both males and females have rape fantasies, males are likely to fantasize about raping a desirable female, while females are more likely to fantasize about being raped by a dominant man, and you cite Hawley and Hensley 2009. That's right. So our, our, our readers can go and look up the data. But Ed, another puzzling question. What is the evolutionary cause of feminism because I read your piece and based on what you have been arguing it appears that feminists are not really interested in gender equality on the one hand they argue that men and women are equal and women are autonomous and independent but based on what you have been saying yet yeah, based on what you have, have been saying it appears that feminists like to be dominated 
that's a popular that's a constant limb motif in your article well it's it's um it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not quite that they want to be dominated. It's it's that they are adapt, adapted to an ecology of of of, base, of of just live fast, die young, kill or be killed sort of thing. And therefore, to the extent that they will have sex with anybody, they want that they be attracted to anybody. Yeah, they're, they're masculinized women. That's why they think like men. That's why they have the kind of hands that men have. They have physical traits that are that are, that are masculinized. Um, they have the more male-like personality because they are evolved to that kind of ecology where the man will not invest in them, and therefore, in order to survive, in order for the, any children they might have to survive, they have to take on more masculine traits. Which is why you find there are race differences in um, sexual dimorphism. And, and in certain uh, races, the sexual dimorphism, where, where, where the men will invest, and it's a very K strategy, like the Eskimos, the Inuit, the sexual dimorphism is very high. And then in others, it's lower, like among, let's say, the pygmies, there's very low sexual dimorphism. And so um, what you've got is the, to the extent that they want to have sex with a man, they want that man to be a, a, an utterly dominant man. And that's... Um, uh, uh, militates in favour of rape fantasies, masochism, and things like that, because it's, it's evidence of his dominance, of his powerfulness. It's like if you consider a woman getting pregnant, um, the, the egg wants the best possible sperm. How does she... So, so the egg conceives of what's happening to her as rape, um, that, that she's being attacked by half a billion spermatosa. She fights them off with everything she has, her vaginal mucus. You know, this is a violent fight to kill these spermatosa. She's being raped, essentially, and the dominant sperm gets through. That's, that's a, a metaphor that I use in the, in the paper, and, uh, um, um, and which I think makes sense. So I, I, a lot of these women, like Andrea Dworkin, people like that, as, as a rule, they hate men, but they don't want to have anything to do with men. Yeah, Andrea um, Dworkin, I remember her. Yeah, men, you know, they, they live in harems of other women and they fight off the men. They do everything they can to fight off the men and therefore the dominant men get through. It could be argued, in fact, that what feminism does um, is help to create a society. You know, this is the whole thing that's very fashionable to talk about at the moment, incels and whatever. It helps to create a society in which uh, it, it is the ultimate shit test for men. Like in which everything is set up to make it difficult to be a man. You live in a society where all the women, all the teachers are women, where you're told that being male is toxic, where you're indoctrinated to believe it's bad to be a man, where you're told it's okay if you go through a phase of feeling like a woman, that you should become a woman medically. And what this does, this feminist set up society, is it selects out all but the most genetically, mentally, and physically healthy men. And so only they get through um, this um anti-male hell which has been set up by a, a feminist society so it's it's, a, it's an attempt to 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 um uh, to, to, to remove um, all the, the best most dominant uh, most genetically healthy men because those men won't be inculcated to become transsexuals or in cells or, or you know to play computer games all their lives or whatever it happens to be they will still keep going so you could argue that's what feminism does it's it's a it's a it's it's rather like with a, a no cats having sex the female will literally fight the the male cat that's trying to have sex with her and then when she's dominated by that other cat then she's then she's content that he's got good genes or whatever and he's worth having sex with. She'll let him have sex. And then the moment he withdraws, she'll, she'll immediately attack him again. Um, so, you could compare it to that. So the, the, so the long-term consequences of feminism from, a, from an evolutionary standpoint could actually be positive? Yes. Um, um, in, in, in fact, I've, I've argued that in a, in a book that I'm writing at the moment, that, that you, could, you could argue that what, woke, what we have, not just feminism, but wokeness as well. So what, what we have is um, this uh, collapse of Darwinian selection pressure, this massive rise in mutation. And if that goes on forever, then eventually you get mutational meltdown and the population dies out. But it doesn't, because the result of it is eventually a, a, a certain percentage of the population are these extreme individualists, including feminists. They then take over the society and push it in a more individualistic direction. 
suddenly people aren't being inculcated with adaptive ideas, with group adaptive or even individual adaptive ideas. They're being inculcated to be told that they shouldn't have children, that life is pointless, that it's not worth living, that they should kill themselves, that whatever, right? And, and only those that are very, very genetically healthy, who are for, who for genetic reasons um, are, are, are immune to this and, and just have these adaptive desires to have children and whatever, only those people will survive this. And so you get this explosion of mutation, but then something hits in, i.e. the fact that we're group-oriented and a certain level of individualism is which we tip over to individualism, we indoctrinate people um, to not want to have children. And then only a certain group, the healthy people, survive it, and all the other healthy people die out. And, and, and you could argue that that's what wokeness is doing, and that's what, um, that's what feminism um, is also doing. And you could argue the other thing, and this reminds me of something you said, Lipton, I think about... Um, about race politics, you said yes. that it's, uh, it's 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 um, some of this race politics is a way, you know, that you for for, for, for sort of high status black people in America to uh, inculcate other blacks with a, a sense of of you know meaninglessness and whatever and you know left wing and shame while they go and dominate and make lots of money. So they tell black people, oh yeah, don't work hard. Oh, it's all, it's all about oppression. Oh, you know. Whereas they don't follow that view. They actually you know work hard as if they could get somewhere, and they do. They don't. They don't follow the view that oh, if you're if you're black in America, you're never going to get anywhere. It's all, it's all systemic racism. They just go for it, and they tell other people that it, almost like it's not worth trying because of systemic racism, and therefore they become dominant. And so you could argue that one of the things that, 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 that uh, feminism does, and uh, is 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 exactly that. It inculcates the population with a with a sense of futility and whatever, so that they um, a lot of people just don't even try to compete for status. They just think it's so. Uh, life's pointless. What's the point? And then those people, Machiavellian as they are, they do compete for status with less competition. So that could be relevant as well. Yeah. According to Anthony Ludovici, a brilliant philosopher, and if you are not familiar with him, you should read him. Ludovici said that feminism is actually redolent of an emasc of a society that has become feminized in the sense that the men are no longer strong, so the women are overly masculine. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think you could argue that as you as you move through evolution, the towards more patriarchal societies, the degree to which the women are masculinized decreases, like they, they as it literally decreases. So, so they are physically less masculinized and they are mentally less masculinized. They are tamed by evolution to a K strategy and by evolution to patriarchy, and we've taken away that evolutionary pressure towards uh, women that are adapted to that ecology. So obviously, and to men who are adapted to that ecology. So what you're going to get is the rise of much, uh, uh, is the deviation from the norm that you had in 1800. And that's therefore going to be women becoming more masculinized and men becoming more feminized. And that's what you saw, even in the mouse utopia experiment of, of Calhoun, you saw that the the women become more masculinized and start taking on male roles and start killing and fighting and stuff. And the men become more feminized and they you know, become the beautiful ones and they don't compete for territory and whatever. It's all, it's all exactly that with these mice. Although doubts have been raised about the uh, probity of some of those experiments. But, but you, that's certainly interesting. That's what you see and that's what you'd expect to see with us. But what you'd also see, though, um, with humans um, is a rise in mutational load, which would be associated with infertility. And that would be associated with these high mutational load people and also a world view in a very environmentally sensitive species. We are we are evolved to be pushed along exactly the right road map of life. Um, that's what we evolved, we're very environmentally sensitive, very K oriented. And if it's not the right road map, then unless you're genetically highly instilled with these desires, in, you know, to have uh, children or whatever, then things can go wrong and will go wrong. And so that's what's increasingly happening. And then once you get these individualists that take over and literally push you in a maladaptive direction, then lots and lots of things go wrong. And there will just be some people that will be, for genetic reasons, so high in what are happen to be evolutionarily adaptive desires, such as one of the kids or whatever, um, that they, they will survive this. And I think that's what's happening. I, I wokeness, everyone used to say that the crucible of evolution is child mortality. It isn't, because everybody that wants to have children, barring infertility, can have them. The, the, the crucible of evolution is, is basically wokeness and also intelligence, because people that are stupid will have children by accident. So there's these two crucibles of evolution.
Well, Ed, I'm happy that you refer to racial politics because contrary to what you may assume and what others also could assume, it is not, it is not really true. Black people on the right who pretend to be contrarians actually love wokeness. Why would they love wokeness? Because wokeness has created a platform for Blacks who are articulate to criticize woke culture. And because few Blacks are criticizing woke culture, these people are experiencing an increase in their value. So they actually like identity politics and wokeness. Look at their Twitter that's pages. Right, that's, a, that's a very good point, isn't it? I, I suppose you could argue, Lipton, that you, as a, as a intelligent uh, Black man, um, that, that, that is increasingly your niche, and it's, a, 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 it's been very useful for you in, a, in getting, you know, high status interviewees and things like that, you know, the, as you discussed with me, that you, that, that, that you, are, that, that, that you are black, and that the, the rise of wokeness means that, therefore, if you are black and articulate, then there is a niche there which wouldn't otherwise be there um, to critique this uh, the CRT because it's become so prominent. So on the one hand, it, it allows black people who are highly intelligent and a bit mentally unstable to use CRT to gain status. And on the other hand, it allows black people that are uh, group oriented and highly intelligent to gain a kind of status as well. So yeah, that is, that, that is a very interesting uh, paradox. Yes. Yeah, so for example, I have been getting big name academics like crazy. And I, uh, well, people seem to like my show. And interestingly, Ed, when I send out emails, many of these academics respond by saying, I like your show. So maybe the, the content is good and they appreciate the content. But the difference between me and many uh, other Black people who criticize wokeness is that one, I'm not really interested in identity politics. I don't care to criticize it. And secondly, I'm actually on the right. Many of these Blacks are not really right wing in the, in the traditional Western sense. There are blacks who may like capitalism, but they're not reading Paul Gottfried. No, no, I suppose not. And also, um, you'll know that some of them are very prominent. So people like Candice Owens. And so if someone like one of these academics gets interviewed by her, then it's drawing her into the alt right and things like that in some way. But with you, because uh, you're, you're not as well known, um, it, it's, it's just the kudos of being interviewed by a black person. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel good and it makes them look good. Um, uh, and also if they like the show as well, well then fair enough. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite an important niche to fulfill. And it's very interesting that, that that's the point that we've got to the Europeans with this multiculturalist ideology, that um, it can't be criticized by other white people. It takes a savior who is, who is not white um, to, to, to be able to stand up, to, to get away with uh, uh, being able to criticize the heresy because as a non-white person, um, uh, sorry, to criticize the religion, the new woke religion, because as a non-white person, uh, you are particularly a black person, you are worshipped by the new woke religion. So it puts them in a very difficult situation and creates cognitive dissonance when they are criticized by a black person or for that matter, a transsexual or, or whatever. I had a transsexual on my show the other day um, who was very right wing and conservative. And this caused all kinds of cognitive dissonance spasms. Uh, among among some of my some of my viewership, but that person is in a situation, a very interesting situation as well, where uh, he or she is is worshipped by the new religion, but yet um, is prepared to criticise it. But Ed, I don't know if you are making the same observation like I've been making, but many of these guardians of wokeness who are black or fall within a minority group, they are not actually defending the West. So for example, Charles Murray, they may read Charles Murray's book and disagree or have a fit. They don't seem to be interested in racial differences in curiosity or psychopathology. Many of them are unfamiliar with you and people like Michael Woodley of Meany. So I'm beginning to wonder, are these black people really controlled opposition? Well, I, I, I don't know. What to, I suppose that there might be an extent to which some of them are. I don't. I don't like the, the, the sort of the conspiracy idea that there's a control yeah. opposition. Yeah. That there's definitely, there's definitely people there saying, "Oh, let's put up Candice Owen," and that that would be good. But Candice um, Owen was once on the left. She was once on the left. She was well, an activist yeah. at one point. So I don't know so, how much people so, can well, trust that's her. That's the thing with, with women. They often change their political perspective, don't they? They, they, they tend to be high and borderline personality disorder. And this result, I'm not saying that she is. Yeah. But, they, but they, they're more so than men. And so therefore they change identity and things like that. And uh, 
can change from left to right and so on. Um, but but uh, yeah, you may be you may be right. I mean, it's it's a question of finding a niche and and how far you're prepared to go. And as you see with a lot of the people that have been interviewed on your channel, uh, they know the reality of uh, these uh, human biological differences and whatever. But there's there's only so far they're prepared to go in public because they they they, they want to create a niche for themselves as being edgy and whatever. But they still want to get as many benefits as they can of being accepted by the establishment and being invited on TV and you know, have, being able to maintain a job at a British university or whatever it happens to be. So therefore, they they um, uh, they are intellectual cowards, essentially, uh, or, or, or perhaps they're just very canny, clever people to, to, to not get in trouble. But that's 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 what they do. And, and I think you get that you you'd get that with many um, ethnic minorities that have found that niche as well. That only they won't go as far as you uh, in in terms of the race realism or uh, you know, look, look really looking at the heart of these issues because they want to they want to get get the sort of Jordan Jordan Peterson type um, uh, niche for themselves. Whereby, yes, they are terribly edgy and whatever, but they're sort of bravery signals, if you like, that won't won't go won't go fully there. Yeah, I call it the, the limits of black thought. I, at no point did I assume that being black would indicate that one is on the left. But if you are saying that you're a black contrarian, then you should, em well, you don't need to embrace all worldviews, but you should at least know them properly and be in a position to make intelligent comments. And I've seen some black academics who obviously are trolling race researchers. One person, for example, keeps trolling a particular scientist, but it is evident that he's not up to date with the research of Emil Kierkegaard, or even the old research of Richard Lynn. So is this that Zambian fellow? No, not no. Ch Chanda Chisala is not a troll. Chanda no, as a different. I don't view Chanda as a troll, but the, the person I consider to be a troll, I'll share you his name in in an email or via Twitter. But yes, yeah. this this guy keeps arguing with scientists. For example, he said, "Okay." There is a black white gap, but on average, some European groups are lower in intelligence. Well, that is not an argument because they were subjected to different evolutionary pressures. Yes, exactly. And we, we, we know that among blacks. Like Irish, why compared I, Irish to the English or the Germans, why would the Irish be less intelligent relative to the English? Different culture, different selection pressures, gene culture, co evolution. Yes, and also mass emigration of the more intelligent Irish to England and America. So, so um, yeah, I, I think, and e equally, you, you can highlight examples of, of highly inter relatively intelligent groups within sub-Saharan Africa, such as the Ibo, uh, or certain other, you know, groups that have caste systems and things. So, so yeah, it's no, it's no argument. No, I don't, I don't know. I, I maybe with some people. But some people, when the research, you can get people that are absolutely superb and objective at, at, at research or whatever, but they have a blind spot on something when it's personal to them. And, uh, and, and when it's about their ethnicity, if they're particularly, if that's a particularly big part of their identity, or if it's, it's, it's about something else. And so, and so you can get that with people. It's unfortunate. You can get an absolutely brilliant researcher, brilliant everywhere, brave and you know, courageous, but they'll have a one blind spot. And you, you, um, the, you, that they uh, maybe they'll get over it eventually, but at whatever point they they don't. And so I, I know someone like that, a, a courageous, brilliant researcher, but he has a blind spot on one particular thing, and he just can't be objective about it. Yeah, because this particular black person is an academic who is quite familiar with statistics. He's interested in economic and political research. But in relation to race, I really have to wonder if he's up to date with the data. Well, there was a guy that, what's his name, um, Talib, something or other. He's uh, the, 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 the concept of the intransigent minority. He's Lebanese. Uh, I've got, I forget his name. But he's a, a, a very, very intelligent guy. He's done some brilliant research, really brilliant. But he just has this blind spot with regard to race and IQ. He just, uh, just can't um, intellectually cope with the idea and he just comes up with these ridiculous fallacious arguments against it but otherwise he's superb um and it's just a sort of human nature thing really i don't know if i have a, a blind spot on on some area I'm, I'm not aware that i do maybe i have done in the past i don't know but but so yeah you get some people for example they're absolutely superb but when it comes to 
religion and intelligence to research there. They just don't like the idea, perhaps because they're religious, that religious people have lower IQ than non-religious people. And so they, they just can't deal with that. And they, they can't deal with that in a rational way. So for example, Ed, I don't know if you read the article I wrote reviewing Charles Murray's book, and they argue that one of the reasons why Blacks have a lower IQ than whites is due to gene culture co-evolutions. Resilience is heritable. Grit is heritable. Blacks have a faster life history strategy, and Black children are subject to, are subjected to greater levels of stress, and stress can impact IQ. And trauma is also heritable across generations. So a possible explanation is that Black people could be inheriting traits that, that are antithetical to educational attainment. Yes, that's, that's perfectly possible. In, in fact, there was a couple of studies that were published uh, by um, um, Dave, David A. Pither, in which he took the, uh, the alleles that we have that are associated with educational attainment, and uh, he showed that these are, there is a lower prevalence of these in sub-Saharan African countries. And not only that, but the correlation between national IQs and the prevalence of these alleles is 0.9. So um, it, it seems to me to be extremely uh, ex extremely probable. And again, some people just have, they, they, they know that's probably true because why it's an easy ecology um, in which basically Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, in which basic needs are met, but in which it's unstable. Uh, and so therefore there's less selection for impulse control and the thinking about the future and that sort of thing. And so it seems to be obvious that you're going to end up with uh, overall with a low, lower average uh, IQ. For genetic reasons, um, but that, uh, but then what I find more interesting, because the diversity of Africa is so big, um, but because it, because it's so easy, so so therefore there's so many there's so much diversity. Um, what I'm finding increasingly interesting are these these obscure little places within Africa and also within India as well that have really high IQ compared to everywhere else. And I find that very, very interesting. And the, the Ibo is one, and uh, there's certain areas of India where the average IQ is like 105. Um, uh, uh, average IQ is 80, but in these areas, 105. Even within Italy, you get huge differences in Italy. So the average IQ in certain northern parts of Italy is 105, and the average IQ in, in uh, Sicily is 89. Yeah, yes. So, do, you, do you remember the research Rinderman and Woodley did examining APLA groups in, in, in Europe? I recently had Rinderman on the show, and he makes a similar point that genetic genetic evolutionary differences that occurred centuries ago can impact intelligence today in Europe. Yeah, evidently they can. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's, just, it's just a sort of, a, it's just a taboo. We, we used to have taboos on certain things to do with sex, and talking about sex and that kind of thing. And now there's no taboo on that at all. I mean, people can video themselves mimicking sex with a goose and it's perfectly socially acceptable, as happened the other day. Um, uh, but, but we just have a, a, a taboo on this. It just means that you you, you don't understand the world correctly. And if you don't understand the world correctly, then you end up with some cognitive dissonance and, and you, you end up confused. You know, that, that's a bad thing. Um, and I just think it's a, a tremendous tremendous shame that some people can't, uh, and, and it's bad for society because then you have to come up with like a scapegoat in order to explain what's going on. So you, therefore you get a totally unfair situation. So it would be better if we could just be honest about these things. And because we're talking about honesty, Ed, when can I get a book from you on individualism? And I'm going to tell you why I need such a book. Individualism is the most robust cultural predictor of economic performance, along with openness to ideas. One of the well, reasons, what, well I'm doing, I am doing a book at the moment. Um, my deadline is the 1st of September, and it is essentially on the rise of individualism. How many books so, are you writing at, at, at the moment? Oh, I've got about four on the go, one mulling in my mind. I've got, a, I've got a book, my book, Which is Feminism and the Fall of the West. That's coming out at the end of the week. You have a book on witches? Yeah, Which is Feminism and the Fall of the West. Okay. And uh, maybe you could review it somewhere. And uh, that's, that's coming out at the end of the week. All right. And then, then I've got a book uh, next year uh, on um, it's called Left Behind, and it's on the collapse of civilization. Because of the rise of individuals, okay. basically. Uh, and then I've got another book uh, on uh, this is an essay collection, um, and another book on the, the evolutionary dyna dynamics of Christianity, and those are all written. And wow. then I'm writing one on dysgenics. 
Wow, you know, you, you know, Ed, you are my, you're one of my favorite young academics. I'm not going to lie, I don't have much respect for people under 60, but for someone who's just, what, 40, you're just so brilliant. What's your IQ? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah, well, well, I need to write a book, Ed. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. You're only a young chap, aren't you? So there's, there's plenty of time. Yeah. But back to so, individualism. Back to individualism before we wrap up. Yeah. Individualism is linked to confidence, risk tolerance, and income. And I do recognize that outside of America, Black academics in Africa are just remarkably brilliant. There are Black people in, in Africa today doing research on genetic distance and its relation to IQ. They, oh, who? Who? Who I can't. Doing? One is from the Congo and one is from South Africa. One did a paper with uh, Christensen and, and Rinderman. One did a paper with Rinderman. He's from the Congo. But, and one is from South Africa. I know, that, I know there was a guy from the Congo who was a doctor who did some really interesting research on the evolution of rape. Um, I, I forget his name, but I remember reading his paper, and he, he looked at the he looked at rape as a weapon of war um, yeah. in in the Congo. Well, that was, that was a very interesting paper. But one of the reasons why African Americans are underrepresented in academia that is independent of IQ is individualism and openness to ideas. So, for example, if I am a black economist, I can write on the economics of innovation. But the most prominent black academics seem to be obsessed with race. They like to talk about race and they also like to explore class, whereas a white man will write on Asia, J J Jamaica and South, and South India. That's a big difference yeah, well, between black academics and white ac academics. The scope for white academics is broader. Well, no, I mean, it's, 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 if you choose to do a, a meaningless pseudo-academic degree in black studies or something, then, then you know, you will, fine, you get the, the, the eminence of having the title of doctor or professor or something, but the research you're doing is meaningless and it's a load of rubbish. Um, and it, but, but you, you can see how it would be very tempting for, for black people. It's, there's all these uh, bursaries for these things. There's all this money behind it. And so you can see how it would be rather tempting to do that. And remember, um, identity is more important to blacks than to whites. Blacks even care right. more about their heritage than white people, according to Pew. Well, that would make sense, I guess, if people are more individual, more sort of individualistic in the sense of in the sense of um, uh, um, heights, understanding of that word, I mean, um, then you, people that are, have a stronger sense of identity, a stronger sense of self. And there's some evidence that black people have a stronger self concept than white people because they're less sort of group oriented. Um, and East Asians have a very weak sense of self in that way. So you can see how they would be, uh, A, yes, they would came, care more perhaps about those kinds of issues and be, be drawn into it. In the same way in Finland, you have these departments of Sami studies. Sami, you know, these reindeer herding people of the north. And um, they don't really do anything worth bothering about. Um, and I see, I see those, those Samis as a sort of wasted potential that could be researching something actually worth bothering about, you know. So, so, yeah, that is a bit of a shame. And in, in Africa, you, you don't have that. There isn't the money to waste on that. So anything that's, uh, that's researched has to be worth doing. And so, and so I, I guess that's one reason. I suppose another reason um, could, could be that uh, the, the very highest IQ Africans in, in history would not have ended up as slaves. No, no. I remember when I was on the air show, we discussed the research, the intelligence of slaves, and we argued that intelligent slaves were less likely to be exported. The study was yeah, actually exactly. done by Africans. Yeah, that's, very, that's exactly what you would predict. Although, on the other hand, the average African-American has between um, uh, 10 and 20 percent, 10 and 20 percent um, or 10 and 30 percent uh, white admixture. So you, you do have that element as well. But yeah, you would. So um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, also just, yeah, it's just the issue. Africa is not decadent. Africa is not a decadent place like America. So there's just there's just less of the possibility to, to waste your time with things like women's studies and, and, and black studies and whatever. So there's, that's a, a bit of a shame. For I, I've only met one uh, American black academic uh, who was doing interesting research, maybe a conference on schizophrenia, he's from Georgia. And he was, uh, he was doing jolly interesting stuff. But otherwise, they all seem to be so... Uh, yeah. You know, 
Right. And, well, there's a black academic you should research. His name is Virgil Store. He's interested in culture, economic development, and morality. And there is someone who is affiliated with objectivism. His name is Dr. Aaron Brilly. He's yeah. also yeah, yeah, Aaron Brilly. He's also quite interesting. But the, the mainstream Black academics, even if they are eloquent and do produce good research in linguistics, for example, like Mac Water, I, I can't pronounce his name at the moment. Mac Water, yes, that fellow. When it comes to Western civilization and IQ and these abstract issues, they are not quite interesting. No, well, I, yeah, I, I guess um, well, there's a strong, um, obviously, new religion which dissuades you uh, psychologically from daring to touch these things. It, 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 for anybody that's kind of reasonably pro-social, perhaps, it, 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 it's, 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 it's sort of there in your mind, sort of homunculus saying to you, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't go there, danger, danger. And so a, a lot of pro-social people will therefore find ways of justifying not looking at these things or find um, comforting yet fallacious arguments uh, in, in, in favour of the, the current ideology so that they can better cope. And I think we get a lot of this. And yes. it's, it's a very and brave, unusual person who, who defers from it. I'm quite brave and could be unusual since I went to random funerals. <laughs> Well, but, yes, that was very interesting. Yeah, people really seem to, 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 to like that, that point. But Blacks do play a, pro a prominent role in disseminating knowledge. And if they take this role seriously, then they should engage in more revolutionary frontiers. That, and this, uh, is the, this is what I am doing. That's why you're on the show. Well, thank you very much. Um, but, but, uh, a pleasure, of, of, of course. I don't know. I mean, one of the things that if you talk about revolutionary frontiers, you're talking about genius. And so one of the no, one by of the revolutionary issues, frontiers, I'm talking about the era of research. So, for example, racial differences. Oh, I see. Yeah, controversial, in, uh, yeah. controversial research. Um, yeah. Well, yes. But indeed, indeed, they indeed they should. Um, in, indeed, uh, indeed they should. But you have this. You have this almost unique. Uh, uh, niche for yourself, so I think that's, that's yes. the way forward. Lipton. I think you need you need a you know you've got a growing YouTube channel now and presence. And, okay, you've been cancelled by a few uh, pathetic uh, magazines. Yeah, Marian right? was apparently cancelled me. My information has been eliminated. Even when I Hello. type in Lipton Matthews on the search engine, nothing will come up. I don't know what happened. And I sent some emails, and the editor did not respond, and the editors did not respond either. So yeah, I guess I was cancelled. They, 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 they cancelled you, and, and, and being the kind of cowardly people that would cancel somebody, they're also too cowardly to write and tell you they have done so. So when Olu University, unable to get rid of my docentship, they removed me from their website. They didn't write to me and say, oh, but by the way, we're removing you from your web our website because you're too hot to handle. Uh, they just did so. Um, uh, and I just happened to discover it because someone told me about it. Someone mentioned it. But, but uh, so, you know, it's an absolute cowardice, total intellectual uh, cowardice. And, it's, and it's, it's also rewriting history when it's an online publication and there's no physical record of it. Well, there is because of Wayback When Machine. But apart from that. Um, that it's absolute total cowardice. It's part of all. But on the other hand, it implies that you're doing. I think you're, you think you're doing something right, doesn't it? So all right. Lovely. So I could speak to you for ever, Ed, but unfortunately, we have to wrap up. And I don't have a problem if you upload this interview to your channel. I actually think the interviews that I've done with you, both of them, should be uploaded to your channel on BitChute because they're very good. I really like the first one. Yeah, okay. I, I might I will not do that if you if you yes, I I, I I if you convey it to me in some way. Yeah. Um, all right then. Well, and nice talk to you. Yes, yeah. all right then. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.